Bruce Party is a professor of law at Queen's University and joins us on Letters from a Contrarian for the second time. Welcome back, Bruce. Thanks, Eugene. Thanks for having me. So there's been talk about a vaccine passport, both in Quebec and now in British Columbia. Um, the idea behind it is that in order to get access to non-essential services, you would have to show proof of vaccination. So if I wanted to go to a restaurant or a bar or a club, I would have to show a QR code to the guy at the front door. If I don't show that QR code or if I don't have that, the guy will say, you're not welcome. Um, goodbye. So, so uh, broadly speaking, what are your thoughts on this? Do you think it's a good idea for society? Uh, any unintended consequences that'll pop up from this? Yes, both intended and unintended. So just in general, in my view, these are a terrible idea. It's a terrible practice. Uh, you are asking for, first, you're asking for private medical information. So there's a privacy problem. You are distinguishing between people that's going to split society. Uh, let's just look at the sensibility of this just for a moment. And I'm not a, I'm not a scientist. I'm not a medical doctor. I'm not an immunologist. But there's lots of information out there. And authoritative sources, authoritative sources like the CDC in the US and the UK Public Health Authority um, and others acknowledge now that these COVID vaccines, while they may indeed protect a person who's received the vaccine from serious symptoms, and the experience in Israel and in the UK with the Delta variant suggests that even that might be in question, but let's just, just accept that as the case for now. While they may protect against serious symptoms, what they do not prevent is infection or transmission. In other words, if you are vaccinated against COVID, then you can still catch the virus and you can still transmit the virus to other people. And so the health and safety rationale for requiring vaccines in a restaurant, for example, doesn't really exist. We are pretending that there's an important difference between sitting next to somebody who's vaccinated and sitting next to somebody who's not. And if you believe in the science, the present science suggests that that's simply not true. Now, that doesn't mean that if you're a restaurant owner, that you're not allowed to try to ask people for this information. I mean, philosophically, and we'll get into the philosophy later, I, I hope, but philosophically, if you're the owner of a business and you control the real estate through property rights, aren't you entitled to choose the kinds of customers you want? And in theory, yes, you should, in my view. So I'm not suggesting that, that uh, restaurants and so on shouldn't necessarily be allowed to ask their customers for this, but it, it, makes, it makes no sense. It makes no sense. And those people who uh, think that they are in favor of this kind of, of process should be careful because once you step over this line, what you've done is you've wandered into the area where private personal medical information is legitimate to demand of everybody everywhere in any situation in which somebody might present a health risk to somebody else. Now, sure, we're talking about COVID right now, but why would we limit this to COVID? Shouldn't the same thing apply to other airborne diseases, the flu, for example, and there are lots of others? So there's, there's a lot of, lot of problems here. Um, it looks also like the COVID vaccines have a very limited life, very limited effectiveness inside your body. And authorities are now openly talking about and pushing for the need for boosters, whether it's three months or six months or eight months after your second shot, you're going to require a booster, proof of a booster, in order to qualify as vaccinated. So if you've received two shots now and you're vaccinated and you think, well, everybody should be vaccinated, well, give it some time and you won't be vaccinated anymore um, according to the criteria 
then in place. So unless you're willing to sign on to an endless series of booster shots, you know, indefinitely into the future, then be careful what you want because you, you just might get it. Right. So I haven't heard about the idea that people who do catch it and who are vaccinated will then go on to transmit it just as well as people who are uh, unvaccinated. But I'm pretty sure still that people who are vaccinated will catch it at a less frequent rate than, than people who are not vaccinated. So probably- I don't think that's true. I don't think that's true. And I, and I think, see, this, is, this, is part, this is part of the problem with this whole thing. Part of the problem that we've been dealing with from the very beginning of this, from you know, 20, in March 2020, is that so much of it doesn't make sense. And the stories have changed. Yeah, sure, the science changes as we go along. But, but, but the medical authorities and the governmental authorities have tended not to give us the straight goods on things. And I'm not, I'm not peddling some conspiracy theory. This is the way government often works. They, they hate to admit mistakes. And once they've chosen a path, they're stuck on it because to reverse course would require them to admit a mistake. But the, 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 the most recent science that I'm aware of, that I have read, suggests that there actually is no material difference between your likelihood of catching it, not suffering serious symptoms from, but catching the virus is, is, is really materially no different whether you're vaccinated or not. And you'll see these vaccine mandates, the vaccine passports, rely on there being a difference unless there's a significant difference between your ability to catch and transmit, whether you're vaccinated or not, if there's no, if there's no significant difference, then, then this clearly doesn't make any sense. But no, one's, no, one, no health authorities are really being straight with us about what the decrease in those chances are. And the, 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 the latest that I've read suggests there might not be much. I definitely think that governments and public health authorities will share information that they think is most beneficial or um, lie outright or, mm. or what, deceive people, mislead people into thinking that a situation is different from what it is. One case of that, Jared Brown mentioned when he was cross-examining the person in charge of Manitoba's response to COVID was that she exa exaggerated, uh, no, she, she, she said that the number of available emergency beds was lower than what it actually was, intending to create more of a sense of urgency in the people who were listening. Another example was with the masks at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, experts said that they were ineffective and you were very unlikely to ha protect yourself from COVID. And then they did a complete 180 about a month later saying that right. you should wear it. And the real reason behind that was that they wanted to... Um, keep masks for right. doctors and nurses, which right. I mean, I think is right. a reasonable thing to try and do, but to lie to someone in order to achieve that reduces yes. confidence in everything else that you will say in the future. Precisely so, precisely so. So let's, let's, let's look at this another way. Let's look at the, at the question about whether the vaccines work and to what degree they work. If they do protect you from infection as well as serious symptoms and whether they protect you from transmitting to other people. So if the vaccines work, like across the board, they work to protect you from infection, they work to protect you from transmitting, they work to protect from serious symptoms, and you are vaccinated, then why would you care if the person next to you is vaccinated? Because you're vaccinated and the vaccines work. So, that would make these vaccine passports and vaccines mandates silly. Let's consider the other possibility that the vaccines don't work. They don't work to protect against infection and they don't work to protect against transmission. If they don't work in those respects, then the vaccine mandates and passports make no sense because you're trying to distinguish between people on the basis of which there is no distinction. So it's got to be one thing or the other. Right. And so 
it doesn't make sense. Okay, let me play devil's advocate here. Um, okay. you're, I agree with you that either the vaccines work or they don't work to prevent both serious health consequences along with transmission and prevention. Um, let's say that it, let's say that it does work, but it doesn't work 100% like every vaccine um, does in the past. Um, you would still want to be around with people. I, well, so the issue here is that I haven't read the science that you have read, um, which says that people who have been vaccinated have no benefit with regards to preventing themselves from getting COVID compared to people who haven't been vaccinated. I don't think that that's true right. based on what I've read. Okay. So, well, let's take, let's take that as given for a moment. Let's, okay. let's assume that there is some differential sure. between uh, being vaccinated and not being vaccinated in, this, in the respect of which you can uh, 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 catch or transmit the virus. Right. So, yeah, go ahead. So, so let's say that we are in a situation like that where, um, you know, the, the vaccine works to prevent yourself from getting COVID at a 95% efficacy rate, which is what the original vaccine said. Um, the reason why you would want to only be around other people who are vaccinated is because it just lowers your chances of being around people who are vaccinated or who lower your chances of being around people who are unvaccinated. And if you're around fewer unvaccinated people, it also lowers your chances of being around people who have COVID because people who are unvaccinated are more likely to have COVID than people who are vaccinated. Now, that makes a difference for you as someone who is vaccinated because you might know somebody who you live with who can neither get COVID or the vaccine, someone who is doubly vulnerable. And an example of that person would be someone who is susceptible to blood clotting and the rates of blood clotting for both people who have COVID and people who have vaccines is very high. So you just don't want to risk it. They could be um, what going on cancer treatments and, and taking immunosuppressants and say their body is doubly vulnerable to both the vaccine and to um, COVID. So in order to prevent that person from being at more risk, um, you decide to hang out with only people who are vaccinated and vaccine passports facilitate that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I'm not going to, to condemn people's personal preferences. I mean, I think personal preferences are legitimate. If, if you have someone at home of that description and you don't want to hang out with people who are not vaccinated, then so be it. I mean, it's, it's your life, it's their life, you're allowed to do what you want. But that's not the question we're considering. The question is whether or not, because you don't feel safe, whether somebody else is required to modify their behavior to make you feel okay, even though you're already protected by these vaccines. Part of the theme here that's run through the COVID experience from the very beginning is fear. People are afraid of this. And to be sure, people have died. People have gotten very sick. And I do not wish to downplay that in any way. However, people die all the time in Canada. Yearly, our yearly deaths are about in the neighborhood of 300,000 people. And they die from all the different kinds of things, of course accidents and disease and the flu and, and and so on and the number of deaths that we have experienced from covid if you look at the trend of deaths this is statistics canada if you look at the total number of deaths in 2017 2018 2019 2020 which was covid according to stats canada if you look at their numbers the pattern of total deaths in the country in 2020 is exactly what it should have been. In other words, it's not the normal deaths plus a whole bunch of other deaths from COVID. No, it's around about what you would have expected as a total number of deaths in Canada if we hadn't had COVID at all. And this is just one feature of the fact that we've been fed fear and we are deathly afraid of a virus that does present danger to some people, yes, 
But for most people, no. And if you are one of those people and you have the vaccine, and if we accept your presumption that the vaccine also protects you from infection and transmission, you're, you're, we're not dealing with a situation in which you need to feel fear. It's the fact that the fear has been programmed into the situation and people are, are almost collectively psychotic about this. So devil ad, devil's advocate here again, uh, yep. two things. One is you said that just because I want to be, a, uh, just because I have a preference of taking the more precautious step and, and protecting myself doesn't mean that I should be requiring everyone else around me to get the vaccine. But the, the vaccine passport issue is not a requirement. We, we have all a whole bunch of things in civilized society where we get people to do stuff that goes against their, their liberties um, if, if they want to play the game of society. And it's not even a real requirement. It's just you make the choice to either do it, and there are costs with that, or you don't. So right. one sure. example is driver's seatbelts. You don't have to drive around wherever you want to go. You just, if you are driving, you have to wear your seatbelt. And that's that. Mm -hmm. Same with the vaccine. Mm -hmm. No one's forcing you to get the vaccine. Um, if you want to participate in, in, in restaurants, if you want to go to restaurants and bars and gyms, then you're just going to have to get the vaccine to make it safer for other people. Well, let's just distinguish first between two different categories of requirements. You mentioned uh, seatbelts, but let, let's, before we go to seatbelts, let's just mention or point out or recognize that the restaurateur and the store and so on are private businesses. And unless they are discriminating in violation of the human rights codes that are around, then they can ask customers to do what they wish in order to enter. You know, you'll see signs on the window of the, of the shop that says, that says, uh, no shoes, no shirt, no service. And they can do that. And, and so they should, in my view. So I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing that a shop owner or a restaurateur is, a, is, is able to ask a customer whether or not they're vaccinated. And if the customer can say, I, I don't want to tell you that because it's my own private personal information, and the restaurateur can say, well, I'm, I, I don't want you in my restaurant then. I mean, I, uh, okay. But what's happening in that transaction is that the government is weighing in. And it's weighing in not by creating necessarily, and in some jurisdictions anyway, by, by, by mandating, don't get me wrong, in some jurisdictions they are, but let's assume for the moment that they're not. What they're doing instead is they're weighing in on that transaction by facilitating the restaurateur to refuse entry to those people by providing government means by which to tell if you're vaccinated or not. So it looks like this is an entirely private transaction. But actually, the state is putting its thumb on one side of things. It's saying, oh, well, you can do what you want, but, you know, but here's the means by which, here's, here's the vaccine passport, here are the records, here's our suggestions, here's our recommendations. You know, we think you should do this, and here's how you do it. Okay, well, I, I've got a problem with that, because now you've got the governments doing indirectly what they would have trouble doing directly. If the government, instead of going about things this way via the passports, simply said, right, you know what? We're just gonna be plain and simple. We're going to create a vaccine mandate. Everybody gets vaccinated, period. Okay, well, maybe if you have a medical exemption, but everybody else gets vaccinated, period. And if you don't, we are going to fine you or throw you in prison. Now that's a real mandate. And that would probably be unconstitutional. But they're not doing it that way. What they're doing is the roundabout way through the back door with these passports, getting the private sector to do the dirty work and providing the means by which to do it uh, in, and pretending that they're preserving choice. But this is not really a choice, right? Because if you can't go into a restaurant, you can't get on a plane, you can't get on a train, you can't go shopping, you can't go to a ball game, you can't go anywhere. Oh, but you still have a choice. You can decide not to, you just can't do anything. Okay, well, this is getting to be not a real choice. This is pretending to preserve choice while really facilitating making everybody do it or their lives will be hell. 
So would you be able to drill down and say when something becomes so insufferable that it stops being a real choice and starts being an attempt to make their life hell? Because as far as I can tell, there are multiple situations we have now where, um, where your life does become a bit more of, of a hell than if you don't have it. So if like society is already segregated by the amount of money you have, your, your sure. life becomes a lot more hellish if you have less money. Um, the stuff with driver's license, I know that it's, it's a bit different from, from the situation we're describing because of the public private split. But at the same time, if you live in a small town, you need to have a car. Otherwise you can't, sure. you can't live properly. So would you say that, don't, wouldn't you say that we already live in hell, but no one recognizes it because, because we see that as accepted? Well, to some extent, yes. So let's go back to your, philosophically, let's go back to your, your seatbelt or, or bicycle helmets or other kinds of mandatory things that the government does impose. I'm not endorsing those. Let's take bicycle helmets for a moment. So one of the rationales for bicycle helmets is that if you're too stupid to put a helmet on, the state should make you in your own interest. And plus, we have a public health system. And if we don't make you wear a helmet, you're going to ride your bike without one and split your head open and then cost us um, expenses to treat you where in if you had a helmet on, it wouldn't be as expensive or catastrophic. And therefore, we're justified in telling you what to do. Okay? I don't buy that. What you've got there is you've got the existence of the public health care system acting as a justification for the state to tell people how to behave. Now, I might choose to wear a helmet. I might choose to wear a seatbelt. I mean, I think driving in a car without a seatbelt is a stupid, stupid thing to do. But that doesn't mean that I believe that people should be required to. People, the, the role of the state should not be to protect people from their own stupidity. And you're doing it in their own interests, which is one of those lines that we're not supposed to cross if you believe in a certain philosophy. This COVID thing is almost exactly the same, but not quite because you have that angle of it, you know, if you, if you're doing it for, for the sake of other people. And that's the thing that makes it, you know, it's so much more attractive than the bicycle helmet situation, because you can say, well, it's not just for you. It's for the good of society, and you should man up and take the vaccine because everybody else is, and therefore, if you don't, you're a pariah. You know, and this is this is one of the dangerous aspects to this. That argument um, essentially says you are not allowed to decide for yourself. We will take away that that very central principle that exists in our law, not to mention our society, which is that patients get to decide what treatments they receive. It's, it's very deeply embedded in our common law, in our tort law, that, that no physician, no medical practitioner is allowed to touch you in your own interests unless you say, okay. Even if the, if the doctor knows best, the doctor knows best that you need a blood transfusion and you say no. If the doctor goes ahead and gives you one, the doctor has committed a battery and is liable to you, even though he acted in your own best interests. And what's happening with these mandates, especially when, when he, the danger is that when employers require them, people feel stuck and they'll go and get a, a, a vaccine because they, they think they must. Um, and that doesn't mean when they go to get the vaccine that they're not consenting. They are consenting. They go, it's the same, it's the same problem as if, let's say you, you have a job and the employer says to all the employees, we require, at this workplace, we require people to have short haircuts. And you think, damn, I don't want a short haircut. And then you think, well, I'm being coerced. Well, you are in a sense, but not, not really, because you don't have to keep the job. You can leave and go elsewhere. But if you want to keep the job, then you have to go to the barber. And you sit down in the barber's chair and you say, well, I don't really want a haircut, but I want to get one because if I don't, I'll lose my job. And so the barber cuts your hair. But the barber hasn't committed a battery because you came to him for a haircut in the same way you go to the, to the vaccine clinic for a vaccine. It's not like you haven't consented. But the basic proposition is, is, is basically attacking that idea, which is 
Socially, you shouldn't take it upon yourself to weigh the risks and benefits for yourself. You should just do this for the benefit of the whole. And, you know, that's, that's, that's not the way we do things in this society, or at least didn't used to be. You have the right to make your own risk assessment and to make your own choice. Now, let me go back to the coerced coercion question that you mentioned. I mentioned the, the, the short hair and the barber. It seems when you're dealing in a private situation in which you don't think you have many choices, that you're being coerced. Either you get a short haircut or you leave the job and you think, well, I need the job. I don't want to have to look for a new one. I'm not sure I can find a new job. So I'm coerced. I'm stuck. But it's a private, it's a private interaction. There's no violence involved. The state is not saying you must. So although it seems coercive because you're in a tight spot, it's actually not. You have choices. They may be not attractive choices, but they're choices nonetheless. So when you have this kind of job requirement, including a vaccine, it's hard to call it, call it coercive. The problem is that this has become so widespread and so government driven that what would ordinarily seem not coercive in the terms that I just described is becoming coercive because there's no place else to go. The, the, the agenda here is to isolate and exclude a whole category of people. And it's not just a matter of, oh, you're going to lose that job. Well, I'll go apply the hill here. Well, but they all have the same requirement. If this was really a marketplace, a, 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 a true marketplace of competing companies for employees without government influence, then it it probably wouldn't be operating this way. This is the odd and interesting phenomenon of everybody thinking the same thing at the same time with government encouragement. And this is a dangerous thing. So my understanding of coercion is that it is violence. Unless you have the threat of violence, you can't coerce someone. It is it is simply two parties um, choosing in choosing freely to transact with one another. Um, right. So there isn't a threat of violence, even if you don't show your vaccine passport um, to, to a business. Right. Um, so how is it that the government is coercing you? Where's the coercion here? Yeah, so the, coer the coercion, I, I grant you, the coercion is, is indirect. It's not, it's not coercion in, this, in the sense that, that we would understand it. It's not a law that's being enforced at the, at the uh, end of a gun. True. But what you have here is a, an, a, a, a program, if you like, of government activity funded, by the way, by the public purse, those taxes uh, collected at the point of a gun with violence, right? You have a government uh, program of, of information, indoctrination, propaganda, encouragement, facilitation, um, and, and, and the like. And the objective seems to be that they would wish to get, not, they don't wish to simply make it possible for private businesses to make their own neutral choices about what to do. They have imposed upon them, now not, again, not, not by the kind of force that, that you're referring to, but they've imposed upon businesses generally of various types to do the government's bidding for it so that those people who are choosing not to get vaccinated literally have no choices left. So if they lose this job, there is no other job, competing job offering the other alternative. That's what you would get if you had an actually free marketplace. You would get some employers saying, you know, there are a lot of good people that are being let go who are not vaccinated. I could get some really good employees if I decided that I would take them. And maybe we'll find that as time goes by. But right now, it seems to be overwhelming that most employers, or at least most large employers anyway, 
are, are getting on the bandwagon. And this is one of the features in a society that has become, uh, if you like, characterized by, not by capitalism, not by free enterprise, but by corporatism or captured capitalism. You have big businesses which are benefiting from state regulation. The best example is the banks, right? The, the, the six big banks in Canada are essentially protected. They're a cartel. And there's no coincidence that the six big banks have been among those big employers that have said, all our employees must be vaccinated. Why? Well, because in that sense, there's not really competition in a free marketplace. You're not going to get other banks, small banks, come along and say, we're going to compete for those employees. There's no place for an employee to go. If you work at a bank and you're not vaccinated, you can't leave the Bank of Nova Scotia and go to the Bank of Montreal because they're all in on it together. So, okay, we have, we've gone through the, the situation and, and why governments are doing the coercing in an indirect way. But so, so for now, let's take the government out of the situation. We live in a province, perhaps it has mostly French speakers and most of them will, well, most of those people, 80, 90% of them want to, to, to have vaccine passports. Most of the businesses in that province will want to have vaccine passports. The reason being, one, they feel like it's safer that way, just just psychologically speaking. This mm -hmm. is what I've noticed. Psychologically right, right. speaking, it doesn't matter. Yes. You are unvaccinated. I want to stay away from you. There's something right. wrong with you. I can't explain why, but I'm doing it right. for my own good and for everyone else. So, exactly. Yes. So people, and, and that's the first reason. And the second reason that business owners might want to mandate people coming in to have their vaccines is because they don't want to chase away the customers who will only visit if everyone else there is vaccinated. And mm -hmm. I think that most Canadians would be in favor of vaccine passports and they would feel safest when they knew that everyone else in the business was also vaccinated. As you mentioned earlier, fear has been an issue uh, in this pandemic. And I think that this fear has leaked on into into these vaccine passport situations where even though you as someone who is vaccinated might be protected, you're still afraid of other people. And it's really hard to get someone who's afraid to not be afraid. And mm -hmm. in situations where there's a marketplace of ideas, the, the, the minority who's the most intolerant will generally win out. So in this situation- The, the, minor, the minority who's most intolerant will usually win out. That's a very interesting statement. Oh yeah, from that's from Nassim Taleb in his I think skin right. in the game. The right. idea right. so right. like wheelchairs and and uh, at one yes. point in the year all Coca-Colas become kosher uh, because right. no one else has an issue with it. In this situation um, people who are vaccinated just don't want to be around people who are unvaccinated. So even if we have a private or, or a marketplace of ideas, no government coercion, um, people who are unvaccinated will still be pushed out of civil society. And, and, and I would say that, uh, I don't know. Yeah, let's say I'm playing devil's advocate. It's still right. wrong because you look at John Stuart Mill on Liberty, he says that that's completely fine to use social yes. exclusion as a result, as a, yes. as a consequence. Yeah. I don't have a problem with that either. So if, if it is that you're describing, let, let's take the government out of it like you suggest. And you have only private transactions between private businesses and customers. And the private businesses assess things just as you've described and think, well, more of my customers than not don't want to be in the same building with not vaccinated people. So I'm going to require everybody at the door to be vaccinated. Okay, I accept that. As long as there's no government involvement. Now, if you're asking people at the door, how are they going to prove it? They could do they show, need a do they need a government passport? I guess I guess so, or government proof. Yeah. Okay. So when, so now we're not talking about the same thing. How so? Because, because the government has, because the government has chosen to make available proof of certain things and not other things, and the government is not being neutral in that. The government is not only facilitating it by providing the means, 
but is also, as I said earlier, is also pushing for that result, which is why they've chosen to make that available. So I got no problem with your scenario. If it's truly just private people operating according to their own, their own inclinations and their own, you know, marketplace um, signals, no problem. But that's not what we got. I, I don't see that. I, I think that just because the government provides you with, a, with proof that you have been vaccinated, it doesn't mean that they are somehow facilitating in some bigger scheme of coercing everyone to get vaccinated. Well, but, but why, isn't there, why hasn't the government provided proof for all kinds of other things? I mean, there, you're not really making the argument that the government is neutral about this and doesn't really care whether, whether people check to see if they're vaccinated or not. They, they do care, but I'm, I'm saying that in this case, it doesn't, it's not for the purposes of incentivizing or coercing people to get vaccinated. Perhaps, I, for it's, one, it's not, really. It's not, it's not for that purpose? Why it not? is not. Let's, uh, let's say that there was someone who wanted, uh, who, what? If they wanted to see how many people had allergic reactions to the vaccine, they would need reliable information and then people who had received that allergic reaction, um, let's say they were going to um, an insurance company, a private insurance company, and they wanted to show them that, my, my example is getting far-fetched, they wanted to show them that they have um, vaccinations and, their, and their, their health history, they would need accurate information about their health to show to this to this insurance company. So right. just right. So part, so part of the problem, part of the problem in this country is that we automatically associate medical care, medical treatment, medical records with the state. And that's part of the problem. If you are, if you were in a free country, then those things wouldn't be done by the state. They'd be done by a doctor or a hospital or a clinic, and they'd be, that would be private. And you would go and you would get the records from the clinic and offer them to whoever it was, to the insurance company or to the restaurateur, and say, this is what my doctor gave me. And they'd either accept it or they wouldn't. Okay, okay. But, but medical things are not automatically state things. And we are thinking this way partly because of the system that we have. We're thinking that medical safety, public health is a government thing and the government must be involved in the decisions that we all make about our health. Not true. Okay, so just to be clear, one, you think that, that even if governments are not mandating that you get a vaccine by fining you if you don't have it, if governments have vaccine passports for private businesses, that that equates to a form of coercion. That's the first yeah, thing. Yeah, I, I realize it's a stretch, but, but okay. because of the reach and, uh, and the, and the um, I'm not going to call it universal because they're still concentrating on, on what they're calling non-essential, but, be, but because of the influence of government in this space, I would be inclined to think of it more as coercive than, than not. I, I know it conflicts with the traditional definition and the definition that I've used myself in the past, but if you compare it to what would happen if the government was out of it, then I, I, think, that, I think that comparison is, is justified. Okay. And the second thing um, that you think is that as long as the government is providing you with information, with proof that you have been vaccinated, um, they are coercing you to get vaccinated in a situation where businesses individually require vac proof of vaccination just between two private entities for you to enter their business. Right. So, yeah, I recognize the difficulties. And if you had, again, if you had just that situation, let, let's, let's, let's try a new, a new scenario. Let's say you have the government providing this means and the government says, look, we're going to step in and we're going to provide you with these passports if, and you can use them if you want to. But, but COVID, what's that? And we don't really care about COVID, but we risk, you know, people have asked us to provide these documents or these electronic means. So, so we're going to do that, but we don't know about COVID. We don't really care about COVID. 
okay, well, maybe, but that's not what we got, right? We have a government that's been pushing a certain kind of information, a certain kind of outcome, a certain kind of stance. They've been pushing fear. They've been pushing cases. They've been pushing two weeks to flatten the curve for 18 months. Right. And so, so the government is, this is the government's play. This has been driven by the government. And for us to pretend now that, oh, this is just a private transaction. That's just, just not true. Okay. Let me, let me fix my, let me fix my phrase. The only, you would say that it is not coercion for a business, a private business of their own volition with no government mandate to ask me for proof of vaccination. If I got that proof of vaccination from Pfizer or Moderna as private companies. Sure. Okay. You would agree with that. I think so. Yeah. So let's back up a step. Let's back up a step and just see if we're on the same page. Yeah. So if we want to be pure about this, we could, we could state the following proposition. If you're a private business owner on private land, then shouldn't you be allowed to make any decision you want about who comes in? Any decision that you want. People who are vaccinated or not vaccinated, wearing shoes or not shoes, men or women or both, white or black or neither, disabled or abled or not, tall or short, beautiful or not beautiful. I mean, the proposition is that people, private people who have private businesses on private property are allowed to make any decisions they want. Now, our human rights code says, no, you can't. Why? Well, because even though you're a private person running a private business, the business is quasi public and therefore you are stuck. You're not allowed to make those choices. Here are the kinds of choices you're not allowed to make. And then we have grounds listed in the human rights code. Okay. So if we restrict the ability of private businesses to make their own choices between this and that, and this and that, and this and that, why will we, because it's not proper to distinguish between vaccinated and unvaccinated. I would be happy with a situation in which private owners of private businesses could make any choice they want, any choice. But that's not what we got. And as long as we have a regime in which private owners of private businesses are not allowed to make those choices, then as far as I'm concerned, making a choice between vaccinated and unvaccinated is also one of those distinctions they should not be allowed to make. Okay. Okay. So I thought what we should do, we, we, we had a bit of a back and forth that, that took longer than I thought it would take. Um, I thought we could go through a, a bunch of such scenarios that might be happening. We already went through if your employer is asking you to, to get the haircut or not, or get vaccinated or not. Now it looks like what's going to happen is, or if it hasn't already happened, um, health ministries are asking, not asking, they're mandating their, their, their doctors and nurses to get vaccinated or else they will be um, let go from service. Does right. that, moving towards more of a, a legal framework, is that, you, you said earlier that if governments did have a vaccine mandate where they made everyone get vaccine or else be fined, um, would, would a situation with an employer mandating vaccines be protected by the charter? by any human rights codes? Well, well, possibly, right. So it would depend upon the employer, right? So the charter applies to um, government and not the private business. So if the employer was a private business, then no. But if the employer is part of the health system that the, then a court might think, well, actually this is government, then, then yes, then the charter would be part of, uh, part, part of the, of the law that, 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 that agency would have to follow. Now, whether or not that would violate the charter is perhaps not that quite, not straightforward. So what we have in the charter, we have, um, we have the right to freedom of conscience and religion. We have the freedom of thought and belief. We have uh, the, the, the right to liberty and security of the person. 
Um, are any of these things engaged? Um, possibly. It certainly would be the case that if you had a pure mandate, like I referred to earlier, that if the government said everybody gets a vaccine, in like, or, and if you don't, we'll throw you in prison. Okay, well, that I would imagine that that would violate Section 7, security of the person, because you're, you are taking away the right of people to decide for themselves what treatment to receive. If you're a doctor or a nurse working at a, at a government hospital, then you still have the same choice you had as with the haircut, which is, well, it's not a universal mandate. It's a requirement of my job. Um, does that mean the charter right in Section 7 is violated? That's not quite so clear. So let me give you an example of, of a situation in which the charter right is not violated, even though you're at a government employer. So let's say you're at a government agency as an, as an employee, and your boss, let's say you're a policy person of some kind, and you're working on a policy document, and you, you submit it to your supervisor, and the supervisor doesn't, doesn't act on it, and you get frustrated, and you think, well, you know, this is, this is a government employer. I have freedom of speech. It says so in section two of the charter. So I'm gonna write about this policy document in the paper because I have freedom of speech, so that's what you do. Even though your employer has said, these policy discussions are confidential, okay? Do you have freedom of speech? Has your boss violated your freedom of speech guaranteed in the charter because you work for the government agency? No, no, it's a government requirement. It's, it's, it's a reasonable thing as an employee that you would have confidentiality requirements with respect to the work you're doing for the government boss. So just because someone said you can't say that doesn't mean necessarily that your charter of freedom of speech has been infringed. So same, not exactly the same, but the same kind of question arises with respect to these vaccines. Just because you're at a government um, um, place of work doesn't mean that they're not allowed to require a vaccine in the same way that a private um, business might be. And I can't give you a, a firm answer to that question. It, it, it depends on the nature of the mandate and it depends upon the nature of the right that you're, you're, you're claiming. I, I can give you a maybe, I don't know. Okay. Um, so what about the argument that the, the freedom to sneeze and cough your virus ends at my nose? This is something that right. Michael Shermer put forward in Colette. Right, right. right. Well, okay, so let's, let's again back up one step. So we all have rights against each other. And one of those rights is not to be touched. And if you do touch me or, or punch me without my consent, then you commit a battery. Same thing if I come up to you, let's say I don't actually touch you with my hand, but I, I spit in your face or I cough in your face on purpose. I breathe on you. I come up really close and I cough on you so that my my air and my spittle lands on your cheek. Okay. That's also a battery. I'm not touching you with my hand, but I am projecting things that land upon you. And when you do that, that's also a battery. Same thing as if you pick up, picked up a rock and threw it at somebody and hit them. That's a battery, even though you haven't touched them with your hand. However, that's a very different thing than being in the same room and sharing air with them. So if you're sitting on the couch with somebody and you're just talking and you're breathing the same air and it just so happens if you if you were able to look at the air that was being exchanged in the room you said well that person just breathed it out and that person breathed it in and therefore that's a legal wrong no it's not that's not the same thing at all if that person sneezes into the room not on you not on, certainly not on purpose tries to avoid you tries to be polite sneezes into their into the into their elbow and you watch where the air goes and it goes into the room and then the other person maybe ends up breathing in or not sooner or later is that also a battery no a battery requires both contact and intent so we're not talking about a battery yes you can't sneeze on other people but that doesn't mean that other people have the right not to have you breathe in their space if they don't like who you are if they don't want to be in the space where you are, they can leave. 
Now, if you have property rights over that space, well, then they control it and they can ask you in or not. Okay, that's fine. But if it's not one of those places, let's say you're in a park. Person on the bench, if you come and sit down on the other end of the bench, they don't have the right to say, you can't sit there because you haven't proven to me you're vaccinated. No. If you don't want to sit there on the end of the bench where the other person is sitting that you don't know, then get up and leave. You can't control other people's movements unless you own the space that they're in. So wouldn't that, in, with HIV, as I understand it, you, you can be fined or even go to jail for passing it on to someone else if you haven't um, warned them of the risks. How is right. COVID different? Right. Okay, so in the case of HIV, HIV what, you're, what you have there is a transaction. It's a sexual transaction. And as I mentioned earlier, in order to touch somebody in any way, you require their consent. So one of the things you need to have a sexual transaction is consent of both parties. Now, the question is, under what circumstances is that consent vitiated, as in validly given? And the argument about HIV is this. If, if, if the person you're dealing with consents or appears to consent to the sexual interaction, but you haven't told them that you have HIV, then perhaps we should consider the consent not to really have been given. And therefore, you have committed a battery against them. Right? Because you're doing it without consent, because you've omitted a very important fact. But if you're in the same room with somebody or, or on a park bench with somebody, you do not require their consent to be on the bench. So there's no the question of consent does not arise on the park bench. If the person on the park bench, when you arrive, doesn't want to be in the park bench, they can leave. And if they don't want to leave, they can stay. But there's no, there's no transaction there. There's no giving and receiving of consent. There's no information that doesn't need to be because none of you are violating any right held by the other. So it's not the same kind of situation. Okay. Um, what about negligence? You're going into an elevator with someone else. You have, you're positive for COVID-19. You've been asked to stay at home. Don't you have a duty to let the other person, <laughs> to let the other person know that you have COVID and, and there's a risk of them being uh, of them being infected possibly possibly i, I it, possibly if you would come to the same conclusion if the person had a cold or the flu or something like it i mean if we would impose liability in those situations then okay we compose impose them in the covid situation as well because we're being consistent now it would not do to be inconsistent to say well you have a cold and you went into the elevator anyway, and somebody caught a cold, but that's okay, it's just a cold. But you had COVID, and you went into the elevator and somebody caught COVID, so you're in trouble. No, no, what's sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander. But the more difficult situation, well, not difficult to figure out, but the, but the one that people are claiming is that not, not your scenario in which you've been diagnosed with COVID, you've got symptoms and been told to stay home. No. The situation that other people are arguing about is if you're unvaccinated and you get into an elevator and you have no symptoms and you don't know you have COVID, but somebody catches COVID, then you're responsible. No, you're not. No, you're not. That's not the, not the way this works. Okay. So universities, I think most universities are going to have uh, vaccination excuse me, vaccination requirements when September comes around. Um, we, we've spent five years, 10 years or so discussing whether university should be a safe space when it comes right. to ideas. Um, right, and, right, right. So, <laughs> and now it's a question of whether it should be a safe space um, for, for like on physical, uh, for, for the body as well. Uh, do you think that universities have an obligation um, or even a right to, to ask their staff and students to get vaccinated? In my view, the answer to both questions is no. And if, if you are going to a university or if you are a staff member at a university asking for um, proof of vaccination, what, what would you do in that person's shoes? Well, so the first, the first problem 
is the, inf the asking of the information, right? So we have a, a statute in, in Ontario called the, the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act. And that act prohibits certain kinds of public institutions, including universities, from demanding personal medical histories from individuals, except in certain circumstances, like if it's authorized by statute, which, which this is not, or if it is necessary, that is essential to carry on the functions that they are allowed to carry on. That's going to be the rub. And in my view, the answer to that question is no, it's not necessary and it's not justified. And this will, this will take us back to some of the points that we made at the beginning or I made at the beginning about the efficacy of the vaccine, right? But all things being equal, the universities in the statute are not authorized to demand that you tell them whether or not you're vaccinated. That's part of your personal medical history. It's none of their business. So that's the first problem. Second problem is, even if they could demand it, what's the health and safety rationale? Going back to our discussion about what the vaccines actually do. Right. If the vaccines don't prevent infection and transmission, then the rationale is gone. It's different, right, for universities. One might say, well, governments want to promote, incentivize vaccination. We want, you know, herd immunity. We want a very high proportion of people to be vaccinated, and therefore, it's good policy to require vaccination to go to a ballgame. But herd immunity and the proportion of people vaccinated in society is none of the university's business. That's not what they're for they're there to govern their own spaces. And so that matter is off the table. What they need to find out in order for this to be valid is a health and safety rationale. And if what I've suggested about the vaccines is true, that is, even if you're vaccinated, you can still catch it and still transmit it, then the health and safety rationale is absent or very weak. So the whole premise is, is, is questionable. Furthermore, furthermore, there are, there are gaps. Here's one gap. Again, going back to what the science says, um, lots of medical authorities have suggested that if you have had COVID and recovered from COVID, then you have a significant degree of natural immunity, which is as good as or superior to the vaccines. And the one thing that the universities do not appear to be doing is recognizing natural immunity and saying that those people who have caught and recovered from COVID don't have to be vaccinated. So that doesn't make any sense. The, 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 the supposed rationale for the policy is to provide for immunity. If you have immunity, then you don't need a vaccine. But the policy says you have to have one anyway. That doesn't make sense. Next problem, there are going to be some people going to universities, students, faculty, staff, who, except for the fact that the university is mandating the vaccine, would not receive it, not, would choose not to get it. Therefore, the university's policy is the reason, the only reason that those people are going to be getting it. Question, will the university take legal responsibility for any adverse event that occurs as a result of you being vaccinated? I'm sure the, they would be reluctant to say so. Now, that, that question, keep this in mind, that question does not depend upon whether you believe the risk of side effects is small or large. It can be very small. But the one thing that we can all agree on is that it's not zero. It's not zero. And if it's not zero, then the question needs to be answered. Will you accept legal responsibility for any side effects that actually do occur? Because without your policy, I wouldn't take this vaccine. So there, there, are, there are some problems. Okay. Well, I guess it, it changes from that's a good answer for the universities for either situations like going to school, 
some provinces have already had mandatory vaccinations for polio and measles, I think, where if you don't have those vaccinations, you can't go in. You, you can't go to school. And then at Not the entirely. Start, Not entirely. Not entirely. Here's, here's the thing about many of those mandates. Mm -hmm. they, they, they are practically mandates, but they're not literally mandates in this sense. It is always, it, I shouldn't say always, and in, I don't know about all places, but in, in some places, the traditional approach has been this. They say it's a requirement, and for, in order for you to avoid the requirement, you're required to make an attestation, an affidavit, that says it's contrary to your conscience or religious beliefs or the like. And if you do that, then they say, okay. Gotcha. So it's more like right? libertarian. So that, mean, that, means, that means you can, they, they, they would like you to do it. And there's some pushing for you to do it. But it means that in those places where that's available, that means that you can excuse yourself if, if it's really something you don't agree with. And the question is whether or not that will be possible with the present vaccine mandates or not. Now, if it is possible, okay, well then that, that changes things a little bit because that means that the government is pushing something, but it's not requiring it literally, or the universities or the employers, right? And that's a, that's a much more reasonable proposition. I still don't like it, but it's a much more reasonable proposition than saying it's this or you're out. Another thing that I get from people who I debate with on the subject is uh, the argument that we already have this when it comes to um, the borders and the federal government, where if you don't have certain vaccinations for, for certain diseases, you're just not allowed into the country. Mm -hmm. uh, so if we can allow those there, why can't we allow the same thing domestically? Because those people are not Canadian citizens and they're not inside the country. They're not Canadian residents. They're outside. They want in. And it's a very different question. I, I think the government is entitled to, to establish the rules that the country will impose upon outsiders in order to come in. But once they're in and once they're Canadian, then they're subject to the same rules as everybody else. And those are the rules we're talking about. So it's a very different, it's an entirely different thing. It's an entirely different thing. Okay. Um, now, here's a question that isn't, you, you, you can't easily throw a book at someone. Um, if you're going, you're going to go visit your friends and family for, for Thanksgiving dinner. They say, yeah, look, Eugene, right. I don't think you're vaccinated unless you're going to tell me for sure that you're vaccinated. I'm, I'm not inviting you over. Right. What do you say to someone like that? Uh, or how best do you have that conversation if you are someone who hasn't been vaccinated or if you're someone who doesn't think that that should be information which needs to be shared? It depends how, how open-minded they are. If they are open to talking about it, you should talk about all the various kinds of things we've been talking about here. Uh, you should show them some studies. You should show them some commentary. You should show them some data. Show them that what they think is the case is not the case. That they're proceeding on, on assumptions that are incorrect. That the difference between you who's unvaccinated and them who are vaccinated in the respect that they believe exists is, it's, it's, not, it's not correct. It's not true. Um, some people are, are open to the, having this kind of conversation and some really are definitely not. Because as soon as you open your mouth about this kind of thing, you're, you're branded as a conspiracy theorist or a, or a wingnut. Because people are, I don't know, a lot of people today are, are determined to believe that what the government tells them and, for that matter, the mainstream media is true. And if you were to, to consider anything else, then, then you're outrageous. And, you know, th that's a recipe for an obedient society. And an obedient society is not a free society. So I, I, I hope when people encounter friends and family who say that, that, that you'll be able to have a, an actual conversation with them instead of an argument. Right. That. That reminds me so much of uh, a response that I would get from people earlier on in the pandemic when 
we were talking about the restrictions and I was trying to find out the rationale for the restrictions and the, the objection, the objective right. and whether it's minimally impairing or not. And they would all say, just look at the science, look at the science as if right. the science right. were a book that, that you could just scroll down and find right. Uh, right. The, the order for every level of society. Um, right. It's, it's very frustrating right. when you right. try and totally do like that. Absolutely. And let's say something about the science, shall we? Now I've, 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 suggested some science here, but uh, science is always open to challenge, right? That's the nature of the business. If it wasn't open to challenge, we wouldn't be doing science. Science does not happen by decree. It does not happen by consensus. The, the science that we are seeing today is not neutral. It has become inherently political. Every scientific statement that you see, especially from an official type person, is, is, is dripping in policy and politics. If you're taking that at face value, you're not getting the straight goods. It, any, I would think that any true scientist committed to the scientific method would invite challenge, controversy, and argument, no matter what the topic. Right. And, and hopefully some debate too, so that people who are listening don't just get exposed to one side of one, one, one side from, from YouTube or another, but yes. get to see where the scientist and his detractor agree on certain right. things and disagree on certain things. Uh, it reminds I mean, me of a press conference that the prime minister of New Zealand held not too long ago. And she basically said, listen to us, believe us, listen to nobody else. Government scientists will tell you what the truth is. Listen to them. Listen to nobody else. It was, it was, it was scary. It was like, this is, this is supposed to be a liberal democracy in New Zealand. I used to live there. Uh, the prime minister telling people not to listen to anybody else but official government sources for their information. Yeah. Um, another thing we could say about science is that there's a difference between an ought and an is, something which yeah. you and Kaylin Ford debated um, a few right. episodes ago. Just right. because science tells you that the infection fatality rate is X or, or that COVID leads to certain outcomes does not mean that we should shut down society or that we should right. do anything else. That is Correct. something that is, um, those are the values of the people in, in power who choose to do with those facts certain things. So anyone who says yes. we are following the science is really just sneaking in their own values consciously or unconsciously into the science and presenting it as the science. And this is the insanity, exactly the insanity of having uh, uh, health officials make policy, right? Because whenever you make policy, you are doing exactly as you just said, which is making value judgments about costs and benefits, about philosophy, about politics. You can't not make those decisions based upon those things. It, it can't be done. That's what policy is. Policy is making value judgments. And so a, a medical officer of health who comes forward and says, we're locking things down because science is lying. That's not what science says because the science can't tell you that. The science can give you the background data. The science can give you the background information about how the disease works. But the choice about the risk and the benefit is not a scientific question. When you weigh those things up, you're making a value judgment by definition. And so policy made by health officials is political decision-making, not scientific. Right, but it's, it's, it's unavoidable. You are choosing which resources get distributed where. That is by definition a political decision. Exactly so. And yeah. I, I, this is something David Redman and I discussed uh, with when I was interviewing him and he mentioned it was one of the biggest mistakes we made was to get health, health, public health people in charge because they're only concerned with public health. They don't, they aren't concerned with other emergency functions like sewage and electricity and food and water and resources. And in Alberta, where he was uh, focused on, um, you saw outbreaks at at food factories or meat factories. Mm -hmm. And everyone was surprised except him because that's part of the supply that was important. Well, let's go further. Let's go further that, because it seems to be the case that the health officials in charge in various places, not only just have, of, have health in mind, but just have COVID in mind. Their priority seems to be to defeat COVID 
as opposed to all the other health problems that people have as a result of lockdowns, as a result of delays in treatment in the medical system, delays in diagnosis. There are all kinds of health problems now that are, have been exacerbated by our COVID policies because a lot of health officials seem to have been focused solely on the COVID question and not even on the other health outcome questions. Yeah, uh, there one except, so today is August 24th, we're recording this. I saw a couple of weeks ago, Alberta was saying they're gonna stop looking at COVID as, as in intensely and start looking at, I think it was um, uh, syphilis in children, something like that, um, because they, <laughs> Right, right. Well, they were moving away from from COVID, and then there was public uproar, and apparently they're going back to it. But um, yeah, it seems like we've all focused in on on COVID as if we're in some war with it when it's a disease. Right, right. Well, see, this is this is this is what happened, right? So at the very beginning, government officials served up the fear about COVID. And it went over so well and was done for so long that now everybody's petrified of COVID and the governments now can't get them off the COVID diet. They're obsessed. Um, this like they're in a, a mass psychosis. I'm not using that in a technical sense. I'm just, you, you know, that's, that's, that's the way they impress. They're all captured by the COVID fear. And it now seems as though even when governments want to move on, the population won't let them because they're all scared. I had a question. Do you think that it was the governments who were scaring people or was it the media? Because like, when I try and think back and, and, and remember how governments were scaring people, I can't come to any, I can't think of anything, but I can definitely point my finger at the media for saying, oh, you are sharing case numbers when that isn't what we went into lockdown for. We went into lockdown to flatten the curve, which is why you should be sharing hospitalization numbers, not case numbers. Uh, for me, it seemed like it was the media. Well, the media was certainly heavily involved, sh sure. But, uh, but the, I mean, they were sort of in cahoots. I mean, it was the government providing the case numbers and the media reporting them diligently. There were there were lots of situations in which governments were having annual or not annual <laughs> annual daily daily press briefings about COVID. You know how many cases did we have today? How many people in hospital today? What is, what's the graph look like today? And the media was lapping it up and then putting it in the headlines. And it's sort of a it was like a two step government media working together to create this 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 event in our lives that was significant and scary and dangerous. And uh, now people can't get over it. Okay, well, we should probably start to wrap up. Um, how, how would you say, what, what would you say is the best way for someone who opposes vaccine passports or mandatory vaccines to best oppose those, best oppose them? Right, well, so the first thing that I would do is not give in, not go along, not do something that you don't want to do. You probably have your own reasons for not thinking that vaccination is a good idea. Maybe you're naturally immune because you had it and recovered. Maybe you've read some, some reports, some science on the vaccines and are dubious about either its efficacy or its risks. All of those things for my money are perfectly valid. It's your call, it's your body, it's your decision. So, so don't give in to the to this social pressure or the or the or frankly the financial pressures. So going to a restaurant is one thing. You can you can skip that. Look for restaurants that don't require this. Support the businesses that allow you to make your own choices. If you come across this at work, again. You know, don't, don't, don't do something that you will regret later. Um, this is a, there's a lot of unknowns here. These vaccines have not gone through the same um, uh, testing over time that most vaccines are. And so your assessment of risk could well be valid. And if you just decide to do it because that's what you think the situation calls for, 
but not because you really want to, then you may regret it later if you go back on your decision. So try not to. And if you get into real trouble, like perhaps losing your job, then in practical legal terms, I suggest that you do not resign uh, and, and make them fire you. Because if they do fire you, then you at least have the possibility, and I'm not saying it's a sure thing, not by any means, but there's a possibility that it might be wrongful dismissal. If the, if the uh, business has imposed a new requirement on you that's not provided for in your employment contract, um, maybe they would offer you severance uh, in the form of, of notice or salary in lieu of notice. If uh, they decide to, to dismiss you not for cause, even though it's, even though it's really for, for the reason that you haven't gotten vaccinated. Uh, don't be shy. It's, it's speak to your friends and your family and tell them you're not vaccinated and tell them why, because they deserve to know too what's going on. And if they've been blinded by the kind of information that they're receiving through very narrow sources like the CBC, uh, then, then you might do them a real favor if you tried to open their eyes and, and, and talk about what you've seen and what you know and what you've heard. Um, there, there, it is possible that there would be legal ways to challenge these things, and, and I do hope some of those suits will be brought, but they take a long time, and they're not sure things. There might be a charter argument, maybe, not for sure. Um, there, there, there might be a, a, a human rights uh, complaint to make, depending upon what ground you're pleading. Certainly, if you have, for example, a, a medical reason why you can't take a vaccine. Uh, but it all depends upon the circumstances and the context. And so I can't answer that legal question for you straight up without knowing what that situation is. It's not going to be a black and white thing. I'm not saying as a matter of, uh, as a matter of definition that these, pa these vaccine passports are unconstitutional because it's, that's not that clear. Um, but but don't, don't just go along. You, you, you know, be, be yourself, be the, take, take the decisions that you think are in your own best interest. That's your job. Your medical decisions are your business. Don't consent without being informed because that's the, that's the principle that this all starts with. All right. And did you have any other last thoughts after that? Well, only, only that this, this is, we're going down a bad road here as a society. And if, if those people who don't see that um, stand their ground, then we might never get back to where we were. And we need to get back to it. We need to get back to the situation where we believe in individual autonomy. We believe in people making their own decisions. We don't, we're not obliged, everybody, at all the time, to act in the collective interest. That's not what this society is based upon. And we're, we're rapidly starting to lose the sense of that. And very important that we get back to it. All right. Bruce Party, thank you so much for coming on to Letters from a Contrarian. Thanks, Eugene. Pleasure.